You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. So let's take the move from Switzerland to Scotland. First experience going to Scotland is they're driving on the wrong side of the road. So that is a massive context change. That's a rule, right? Or habit? What is that? Oh, that's that's a rule if, mm-hmm. if we want to use year three. So in complexity science, we will call this a constraint. It's a constraint imposed on the system, which is the traffic. So first days in Scotland, walking just around the street, you know, you look at the wrong side when you try crossing the road. And I can tell you there were three, four occasions where I nearly got run over. And the experience of nearly getting run over is what alerts you to become more conscious about your behavior. This is how you have to recontextualize some of the things that you learn. It goes yeah. beyond empathy. So what it's taught me is that context change and hence change of practice is, is a necessary thing and has to happen all the time. And so I have developed an interest in how do we better get to grips with context change. A lot of what I'm interested in when I'm working on these things is because I started to understand this is a crucial element in making work environments better because the context changes all the time. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Your host today are myself, Annette Pozsár and my colleague Laura Vas. In our daytime jobs, we research and be a developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hi, Annette, and welcome everyone. Today... Uh, we are going to try to open a door uh, to our listeners to a perspective that they may or may not be familiar with. It was actually new for us uh, in its entirety. Um, I was thinking how to go into this because it's an entire science. We're going to, to name it, we're going to bring social practices through a very special guest, Mark Burkauer. And I was wondering, so how, how do we introduce this? And you probably are familiar with this warning in change management, business strategy, which is culture is going to eat your strategy for breakfast. And I would like to go into that together with Annette and Mark. Like, so how does that look like in a company culture? And, and, and how do you adjust your strategy knowing that there is this culture? And instead of willfully stopping to... This disregard the existence of such things as context and culture. How do you how do you look at that and how do you deal with it? How do you dance with it? So let me welcome uh, also our guest, Mark Burkar. Hi, Mark. Hi, Laura. Hi, Annette. Thank you for having me. We are very, very honored that you're here. And um, when we talked about uh, how to introduce you, um, you asked that we um, introduce you through maturity mapping which is what you are developing together with your two co-founders, Chris McDermott and Keith Robertson. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more? And then I will want to talk further about that later, but just to orient um, how does maturity mapping uh, enter your life and why are you working on that? Okay, so that goes straight into the matter. That's um, a big bite. <laughs> <laughs> how, did we, how did we start with maturity mapping? So... So first of all, um, I should maybe just give credit. The the term and the initial spark came from Chris McDermott, but it came out of a lot of conversations that we had at the time um, about how, how, how can we go about um, in a better way to understand how the work works. So a bit of background, Chris and I both worked for the last few years as agile and lean transformation coaches and organization. So we both have a tech background. So we got to Agile um, initially as programmers, adopted it for ourselves in our own context, and then over time um, through various routes started coaching. And we sort of, so Agile, Lean, etc. They it started to hit, hit a block for us. Um, and the, so now I'm talking more about me. Um, Maybe Chris can at some other point um, explain his story or journey. But for me, one of the problems that came about was that in in both worlds, Agile and Lean, there there was suddenly this articulation of of mindset and of um, it's not about doing Agile, it's about being Agile. Mm -hmm. And I just was terribly uncomfortable about coaching people and having to speculate about their inner lives. 
So before I started coaching, I also worked uh, for quite a prolonged time as a manager. And my experience as a manager was whenever I thought I understood the motivation why somebody uh, that I was responsible for were doing something, when I would go and talk to them, I would find out, no, you had actually no idea. Yeah, so the way we're imagining what people are thinking when we see the, the results of their actions, um, at least for me, was often wrong. Maybe that's just uh, an incompetence on my part. Maybe other people are better at that. But in generally, uh, in general, I find it very dangerous and felt very uncomfortable um, articulating ideas through the lens of um, how people have to be. Uh, nobody goes to work and signs up a working contract in whatever shape or form expecting to be inspected. Yeah, so that that other people. I mean, it, it is part of of social life that we that we. Uh, have models in our head why other people are doing things, but nobody expects that that has to be laid bare. And a lot of art, so agile, modern agile and other articulations suddenly put that in the center um, of the attention. Uh, psychological safety was coming up. Uh, also something I was initially interested in, but um, suddenly I saw everybody around me talking about um, what people have to do in in order to achieve safety. So instead of looking at safety as a system property, um, suddenly it was down to the attitudes of the individuals. Yeah, and, and you saw lots of approaches of how people have to behave and uh, how they have to be in order to create safety. And so I just was entirely uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I looked for alternatives. Uh, how could we understand the work better without having to inspect um, the inner lives of the people that we're coaching or that we're trying to help? And so my background. Uh, university background is biologist. So ever since then, I had an interest in complexity theory. So even at the time I studied, it wasn't called that, it came later. But um, so I always understood things from a system point of view. And I'm reluctant to use the word system thinking, but just because a lot of what you now see as system thinking is still mechanical. So mm -hmm. as a biologist, I understood that um, novelty, emergence, uh, emergence, is the result of interacting things, of, of the complexification of the universe and life, etc. Um, so I, I looked for framings um, that would that would allow us to to surface things about work processes and how work happens that would not require to reduce it to a mechanical kind of thinking. For example, um, if you know about value streams, etc., and lean. Um, they're, they're very material, yeah? So in a sense, it reduces the work to a mechanistic set. So then on one side, you have this mechanistic thing. On the other side, you have this deeply psychological thing. I should also maybe say here, my sisters are psychotherapists. So whenever any of these psychological fads came along, I would ask her, how do you feel about that? And she was horrified that people without the qualification would suddenly go and apply psychological principles in management or coaching. So uh, a turning point for, for me and for Chris was when we came across Wordly Mapping. Mm -hmm. So Wordly Mapping is a, is a strategic tool mainly, or that's um, what it's, um, what it's uh, advertised at. But for Chris and me, it was also uh, immediately evident it was a way of visualizing complexities. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of Wordly Mapping, the way it's taught, um, or mainly taught, has a very material bias. So uh, Chris and I were talking about how, how could we overcome this bias? And we started we started thinking about the phrasing that you see in Agile, that there are three, so Agile has three phrasings that you should pursue in order to get better at work. So thinking about um, what is the right thing to do? So are you actually are you actually pursuing to build something, to create something that is right for the context in which it will be deployed? Then how to build it right? Are you using, let's say, the right architecture or the right tools, et cetera, to build it? And then also how to do this, these two things faster. Yeah. So once you get the interaction between the two things, how to do them faster. And this is how you get to immediately meanings, materials, and know-how, right? Well, not immediately. So Chris suddenly one evening texted me a picture where he mashed up these three phrasings on a wordly map. And it was like a that was the spark. Yeah, we suddenly said, oh, OK, so we're not so married to the material things. Yeah, the, the components of your 
technical system, etc., that you're building, but actually how are we interacting with one another to to pursue these three things. Um, so we went down that route a little bit and started applying this in work and found it quite useful. So we didn't work in the same place, so we could we could compare our experiences of them applying this. And then a friend of ours, um, Jay Bloom, um, pointed us towards practice theory. Mm -hmm. It initially started that he literally, so we were in a room with him and some other people and we were talking a little, so we were sharing experiences with these people. We were talking a little bit about what we're doing with working mapping and, and these three strands. And he puts just three post-its on a wall, meaning material competences and um, started just slightly nudge us towards exploring this. And so we started reading about practice theory and especially, so he pointed out, um, and that is the pivotal book for us, um, Elizabeth Schoff's um, Everyday, what's it called? Practices. Um, she wrote basically her first book about social practice theory, uh, where she explains how, how practices um, can be applied to understand complex environments. And the nice things about talking about practices is you look at it from a social component, not mm -hmm. from an individual component. So this was always evident to us. Um, work is a social endeavor. Um, people come to work, first of all, psychologically, um, with various motivations, but also these motivations change day to day. Yeah. Some days we just some days we just go to work because we want to earn money. Uh, sometimes work is really um, fulfilling, and we're we're bring we're we're capable to bring other aspects, not just the I need to do this in order to get paid aspect to work, but it's not constant. Whereas the social interaction has to be stable in order for work environments to produce reproducible outcomes. Um, this is what creates value uh, for an organization: is that we can reproduce the value um, that we, in the end, can can monetize. And so looking through the lens of practices um, allowed us, first of all, to, to deal with the complexities in a way without to having to explain complexity theory to the people we worked with, but also keep the focus at the social level. So we did not have to inquire, so why did you do this? What were your inner motivations psychologically, et cetera? And how I got to know you and why I invited you. Uh, so some words that are sparkling in all that you said, uh, we heard complexity several times. Um, and that, that complexity is not just a word as in, oh, it's complex, but there's such a thing as complexity science. And uh, you are the co-host of uh, the Deliberate Complexity podcast, which, uh, well, as a insiders and our, my co-founder, Christophe Antoma, he's your co-host. Uh, we are listening to that. So there you're talking about deliberately uh, dancing with and creating complexity where it applies and accepting that as um, the, the natural part of life or that life is complex as such. And you're talking more from a strategic angle. Um, and there I heard you talking and in other conversations about social practice theory, which you now also mentioned. And that is what got my attention very, very much. And hence, we invited you to this uh, podcast, which is more strictly about API documentation and the, the, the life of documentarians and how they can do that better, um, considering the audience and the artifacts that they need to document and then the environments within which they work. Now, um, in a book you mentioned from Elizabeth Schaff, which you also directed me towards, um, I gave it a, let's be honest, quick read. Uh, <laughs> and um, two things that shined for me. One was, what happens if we take the unit of change, not as individuals, but as practices? What does that mean for uh, creating strategies for change? And the other thing was that this idea of creating change strategies um, is so persistently relying of the so-called ABC model, which would be the individual people's 
attitude, behavior, and choice. It's it's just so interwoven into everything that we do that we have, um, at least in the so-called Western cultures, um, now assume that that is a, a fact of nature, that that's just is. And um, in my understanding of the short read, social practice theory contends that by extending this a little bit more, as in you cannot put everything on the individual. And this is where... This is where my entry point of yes, context and culture is going to eat your strategy for breakfast if you only consider the individuals rather than their interdependence with the context within which they are. And that context, of course, includes the other individuals and the policymakers themselves or the change managers or however you call them in, in, in whatever place you are. To zoom in a little bit um, and to make sure that we are understanding each other, what we're talking about. Um, I had a hard time in my everyday language, making sure that I have a clear understanding of what is the difference between practice from practice theory and habits and then rules. Could you help us just a really quick clarification, just simply, uh, or if there's a fourth word that you think is worth mentioning so that we can uh, talk further about these? Why, why is a practice not a habit? And why is a practice not a, an already, a, a rule in the making? So first of all, these aren't hard, there aren't any hard boundaries here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a practice can, can be a habit. So a core difference um, that, that Elizabeth Scholz and other practitioner, practice theorists are making is when, when we share habits, so there, there are things that we all do, then um, there, there's different, they have a different impact on the environment, the context in which we are. So there are definitions about when do we talk about a social practice. So first of all, a social practice has to be shared. By, by which we means, I would recognize this practice when you do it or somebody else does it as the same thing. So simple, simple thing, driving, yeah? So when, when, when we learn how to drive, we learn a set of rules, like how a car works, and traffic, and maybe also some sorts of um, good behavior. Yeah, so um, let, let's let's be a, a driver that is s sort of um, safe within traffic, etc. And so we're, we're ending up doing things that, let's say, a learner can observe several people doing it. So when I learned how to drive, so first of all, I had a, I had a teacher, yeah, a driving teacher. And the teacher would give me specific instructions, but then I would see, let's say, my father how to drive or how my sister drive. And while I noticed a difference uh, between the styles, so there were clear things that I could see, yeah, they're all doing this, yeah? So a habit is something you might do, but nobody else does. Mm -hmm. But it becomes a practice when, when there are things that we can recognize, ah, uh, we have these in common, so they are shared you could say shared behaviors, shared shared habits. Um, also, practice can be very conscious. So often habits we actually would, would call, we would say we do this on autopilot, yeah? Where in order to acquire a practice, at least at the beginning, you have to do things very conscious. If you do it often enough, they become autopilot too. And then it's the ability, can we encode some aspects of this practice in a way um, that we could talk about it? So Shatsky, a uh, practice theory, theory uh, scientist, he talks about doings and sayings, or sayings and doings. Um, so it's not just that we do things, but also that we have a vocabulary that we share um, about the things that we do. So at this point, it becomes a practice. Rules, uh, it fits in there somewhere, but I think so. Has I wouldn't have made that connection myself because it mm -hmm. has a much wider meaning so rules mm -hmm. are things we have to adhere to 
But um, in this context, probably more more uh, importantly, these are things that we know are have have qualities in terms of reproducing the outcome. So we're following certain guide guidelines rules uh, in order to actually reproduce the outcome. So when we're driving, what we're reproducing is we're transporting ourselves from A to B, yeah? And in order to ensure that we're transporting ourselves from A to B, we, we follow certain rules like traffic rules, et cetera, but also certain rules that the car imposes on us. And finally, certain rules that how we integrating the things that we do when we're driving, like braking and steering and looking at the mirrors and signaling and so we integrate these things so that we create a safe behavior so we can collaborate with other people in what we call traffic and still end up arriving at the point that we wanted to so transporting from a to b let's bring context into this okay so keeping with the driving so you're very experienced with context change as you moved from growing up in switzerland and then you uh, moved uh, to Scotland together with your wife. Now that's a context change and the driving habits are certainly different, I'm, I'm sure about it. Um, what does context, where does context translate uh, into this? I, I think everyone did at one point in their life, one way or another, experience this context change and what does that really mean? But how do we translate that into, into this model so that we can talk further about it? So let's take the move from going from Switzerland to Scotland. So they're driving on so first experience going to Scotland is they're driving on the wrong side of the road. Right. Yeah. So that is a massive context change. That's a and, rule, right? Or a habit? What is that? No, oh, that's that's a rule. If mm -hmm. if we want to use year three, so it's a rule. Um so in complexity science, we will call this a constraint. Yeah. It's a constraint imposed on the system, which is the traffic. Um so first days in Scotland. Uh, walking just around the street, you know, you look at the wrong side when you try crossing the road. And I can tell you there were three, four occasions where I nearly got run over. And the experience of nearly getting run over is what alerts you to become more conscious about your behavior. Yeah, so this is how you have to recontextualize some, some of the things that you learn. So in Switzerland, um, growing up, I don't think I ever consciously, so after the age of eight or nine consciously had to think about which side do you look first when you cross the road it becomes second nature it becomes tacit knowledge um and because the context never challenges you um that never surfaces then you go to scotland and within the first day of walking around on your own in a town you nearly get run over suddenly you realize oh i need to i need to pay attention but one experience wasn't enough yeah so i said three four times until um that happened. The same happened when I started driving in Scotland, which I didn't do immediately because I was a bit like, oh, they're driving on the wrong side of the road. So um, that I would go on the wrong side of the road, uh, drive on the wrong side of the road when I drive out of my house, or even, you know, you go over complex crossing that you had to pay attention just to get through. And then you sort of, ah, oh, the relief you got through the crossing, you, you let your attention drop and suddenly you drive on the wrong side of the road. Just back Swiss habit kicks in. So uh, the practice of driving, in a sense, had to be recontextualized for the Scottish environment. And one of the consequences then of living in Scotland, driving there was when I went back to Switzerland. Initially, I went quite often back. And so I, I could still switch between the two modes. But then I didn't go to Switzerland for something like five, six years. And the first time I drove there, I did everything the wrong way around again, as in... <laughs> British driving rules overruled my 30 plus years of, you know, past behavior of Switzerland, um, which is why I don't drive in Switzerland anymore. It's just too stressful um, doing this consciously all the time. So you have a lot of empathy, I guess, towards people who are forced to switch from one context to the other, but bring over their habits and adjust them. Um, so it goes yeah. beyond empathy. So what it's taught me and of course, I could bring a lot of IT, more relevant IT experiences, and um, maybe we do that. Is that context change, and hence change of practice, is is a necessary thing and has to happen all the time. And so I had an interest that developed an interest in how do we better get to grips with context change. Mm -hmm. So a lot of 
what I'm interested in, why I'm working on these things, is because I started to understand this is a crucial element in making work environments better because the context changes all the time. And practice theory fundamentally assumes that there is an interdependent evolution between the person who is acting within this context and the context that is being created by the person who's acting in this context and vice versa and back and forth and round and round, right? Okay, you could actually be practice theory. It's also, this is complexity theory. Yeah. So you, you sh it is almost that you should, you should ignore actually the difference between yourself and the environment. You are part of the environment part of it. and everything changes together. So the easiest way to understand this is if we look at a predator prey relationship, a lion and a gazelle over, over time. Yeah. So the lions kill the weakest gazelles, the slowest ones. Well, that makes gazelles over time faster. Yeah. So in order then to keep up also the lions have to get faster and smarter in catching the gazelles. So as a closed system, so if you look at gazelles and lion as a, as a system in itself, they start to acquire things which also make them more competitive against other participants in the environment. And that has impacts on the environment itself. Mm -hmm. So um, this will be an audio material, but I see uh, also Anat, and I, I'm sure that uh, <laughs> her thinking is very much in high gear because all that you have said about habits, rules, context, um, and, and, and individual behavior, this is very much home territory for a technical writer because you have to guide people into the context of the, the let's say, product that is on a platform that is being documented, considering the cognitive load, the persona's perspective. This is spot on for, for tech writers. And, and so this is our topic, which we got to now. How does understanding this context interdependency and, and the idea that it's not only individuals, how does this come to tech writing? So when Mark was uh, giving these definitions, what did you hear from that uh, as a tech writer on it? Well, actually, um, there's a lot thing uh, going in my mind because when you said these three things, habit, uh, practice and rule, I was wondering whether in technical writing we more or less want to write or create rules to follow for others, or at least we want to document practices, but habits also happens. And uh, it's kind of interfering with all of these. So this changing everything as a system. And uh, what you just said, Mark, about the things on the driving on the wrong side, um, it's something we, we have problems with when we are documenting things because, uh, yeah, when, okay, let's, uh, let's take a step back and let's assume I'm not uh, documenting something related to IT, but if I want to uh, write something about driving or a guide on the road, I might or might not um, realize that uh, in a certain country, the... <laughs> There is another side of wrong and right, uh, and um, it it uh, comes to. So when we are talking about software documentation, it translates to, I don't know, environments or other tool chains people um, use, and it's actually hard to to differentiate those, and have a grasp on how we can um, sophisticatedly add it to the guy that oh. If you are in Scotland, the actually it's not right for you, but I don't know the other side. And um, it, it's really hard because we are biased um, pretty much uh, with our environment or in the system we are living in or heard about. So this, this was something I heard from it. And as a technical writer, we are kind of like in the in the middle of everything when it comes to information and we need to filter the information and translate it uh, to different audiences. And um, in my understanding, an audience or a persona is, is, uh, has habits and practices uh, to stuck with these. And uh, it's uh, rare when we actually know our personas 
So, for example, um, I'm working on software documentation and the developer um, developed a new feature and uh, they do a de demo for us. And uh, of course, we record the demo session or, or at least take calls, uh, take notes, sorry. And, um, and when I'm alone uh, or with my uh, writer team, I'm pretty much looking at those notes. And uh, this became my starting point, whether, um, although it's, it's not the best uh, approach um, when I'm not uh, writing to non-developers, but it's, uh, it just affects my mind or, or my thinking. But uh, if the demo is produced by a project manager, it's, it's a different angle. It's a different context, uh, but we um, the audience is rarely the uh, the same persona, so it's really hard to to translate and filter the information uh, without this cognitive bias, what we just uh, heard and learned. And I was wondering if, uh, um, based on practice theory, is it possible to reach a a neutral point of view or, or a holistic approach to better not be biased with all these contexts or I don't know, because it's hard to. So what practice theory can help you with is making the context tangible and visible. Mm -hmm. So Often what we try to do when we create instructions or, or manuals or any kind of help or maturity models of, of things that we do for other people is that we're actually trying to reduce it to patterns that they can apply. Um, so this is reducing context. And context as a complexity theory would tell you, you going the wrong way around it, yeah? Mm -hmm. So what we should do is actually explaining to people, here's all the context in which we maybe created this thing, yeah, or the context that we are assuming uh, for which we designed how you can use the thing. And so practice theory can help you in so far as in it would, it would give you means of describing um, what practices you are expecting people mm -hmm. um, to apply when they're using, let's say, an API. So you could make that explicit which then would allow the people who consume your API to at least have empathy with what are you actually describing? And they might see then for themselves, okay, so this is how my context is different from what you assumed, but because the context can be experienced, so to speak, even in a reduced form, but not the context not reduced, it's still, it's there, it's, it's absorbable, they can fill in the gaps. So the easy, easy way um, how I usually explain this is the, how, how, do, how do you best actually teach people new practices and technology in general? So in, in programming, we have pairing. Now, um, there's two kinds of experiences that you can observe. So one is you have an expert in a practice, um, and they take you into their context. You say, you want to learn this practice, come either come to my course or come to my team and so on, I show you, yeah? And then you go back in your context and you try to figure out yourself how to apply it. And that's usually the successful. So we know that um, creating a context, for example, as, a, as an expert in which you can explain the practice, et cetera, is a decent way of teaching the practice because it's a very popular way of doing it. Equally um, from stuff I've seen in my work as an agile coach, um, letting people go and pair in a team that does a practice very successfully helps them figuring out um, how to apply it in their context. What is also done quite often, this is called consultancy work, is that the consultant comes in your team. Yeah, So the expert comes to your team and tries to tell you how to do the practice. And that is, in my experience, far more often than not fraught with danger and leads to much problems because the expert doesn't have context. Mm -hmm. So they have to improvise, yeah? They're making a ton of assumptions which they can't test in time for the improvisation. And so they're actually not coherently showing you the practice. Um, and hence, in the end, actually, when they leave you, you're often still puzzling, say, what am I supposed to do? 
So you might have seen some aspects that you know how to do, but uh, practice theory says um, the real key to successful reproducing a practice is that you know how to integrate it in your context. Mm -hmm. So when we talked about the driving, so all of the parts that I learned how to drive in Switzerland were still valid in Scotland, but the way I had to integrate them were different. Yeah, there were a few rule changes, and that required that I consciously reintegrated all these practices in the new context. Now, because I have experienced how these practices are integrated in the original context, I could do this without expert. Yeah, I just needed to learn the new rules and my experience was good enough. So experiencing a practice coherently in a context allows us more likely to then reproduce it for our context. So if uh, if we use practice theory as the basis for explaining how an API is expected to be used, we allow then the consumer of the API, the developer who's using the API, to fill in the gaps in their context. So the gaps that are created in your explanation of how the API works compared to the context in which they want to use it. Maybe not always, maybe sometimes they will need some interaction, but my expectation would be that would still be a more successful way uh, of communicating this. Now, one of the reasons I believe this hasn't been done or might be difficult to do is explaining things through the practice lens requires a little bit more effort. Yeah. So what you said is you're trying to give them rule, which rules, which is also like, hey, you can you want to use this particular aspect of the API, read these two paragraphs and off you go. Whereas doing this through the practice lens will be a bit more um, demanding in terms of yeah. time, but also in understanding. So we probably need to find then a balance, say, okay, here are some things that we really can communicate with rules because underlying actually there is enough shared practice even in the wider context. So your context in that regard of the API is no different from the ones in which we intended uh, the use of it. But other aspects where this is not the case is probably where such an approach might be useful. So when we can't assume the context of the person who's consuming the API, and we even have to expect that their context is sufficiently different, as in, let's say you have a manager or a developer, or maybe, I don't know how managers actually consume API, let's say a tester in an external company, yeah, that needs to test what their developers do with your API. Their context might be very different from what a developer on your side expects how the API is used. So okay. these kind of differences. So then you're not just maybe using the lens of a developer, but also the lens of your tester who tested the API in the documentation of the um, API. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.